Catherine Buskill is the Associate Director of the Center for Global Risk and Security at the RAND Corporation. And currently she is also a professor at the Pardi RAND and Graduate School. As an anthropologist with training in public health, her work incorporates ethnographic approaches with systemis, systems analysis. And her recent research has examined how wealth and well being are being shaped by emerging technologies, as well as how emerging technologies can come to shape the future of global health security. And her topical areas of focus include the role of emerging technologies in health and well being, issues in cancer prevention and survivorship military mental health, social cohesion in a globalizing world, and global health in general. And today she will speak about the future directions of health security in a globalized world, a topic which probably never has been more re relevant than now, especially on this global level. So Professor Bauskill, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I uh, very much appreciate it. And I will just say a, a warm good evening, buonasera, guten Abend. Natürlich möchte ich mich bei unseren Kolleginnen und Kollegen im EURAC für diesen wichtigen Kongress bedanken. A warm thank you to our colleagues at the EURAC for hosting this uh, very important conference. It is truly a privilege to be raising the issue of global health security to a group of scholars who are seeking to understand how forces of globalization are being reconfigured. Uh, and and as, uh, as Dr. Gruber noted, I'm Catherine Bauskill. I'm an anthropologist at the RAND Corporation. And uh, you might not know too much about the RAND Corporation, although it was established over 70 years ago to strengthen public policy through research and analysis. So for over seven decades, RAND researchers have answered truly difficult questions and generated actionable insights through a, uh, a, a, an interdisciplinary approach. So our research and analysis addresses issues that impact people all around the world uh, on topics ranging from security, health, education, sustainability, growth and development, all while maintaining objectivity and a voracious commitment to not just nonpartisanship, but to true anti-partisanship. Uh, we also have offices around the world, including two in Europe, and our headquarters remain where they have right from the start in Santa Monica, California. Uh, the insights I'll be sharing today stem out of work conducted through the RAND Center for Global Risk and Security. And I'll note that the initial publication from the work on global health security was published in December of 2019. What a time to be, uh, to be warning the world of a risk for pandemic shortly, of course, before a pandemic uh, uh, rolled out onto um, the entire uh, planet, every corner of the planet. Uh, the Center for Global Risk and Security works across the RAND Corporation, so across those various uh, areas of focus that I mentioned, to develop multidisciplinary research and policy analysis that deals with systemic risks to global security. And I'd like to tell this story of my first introduction to the center. Uh, it was shortly after I started at RAND and my telephone rang and it was the then director of the center who said, uh, uh, Catherine, I would like for you to join a brainstorming session on the future of risk and security in the year 2040. And I said, thank you so much for your call, but you must have the wrong person. I'm an anthropologist and I do work on public health. So clearly, uh, you know, you're not, <laughs> you, you've got the wrong number. Uh, and he, he said, don't hang up. Uh, I really want you to join. I think we need people um, who have the mindset of, of the social sciences and particularly anthropology and can bring an international uh, humanist perspective um, to how we conceptualize risk in this ever-changing world. Um, and that's really what I've tried to do as associate director is, is infuse the, the human uh, uh, component, social and cultural factors, back into these more traditional ways of thinking about security, which of course uh, simply will not hold in today's world. Uh, we have an advisory board of distinguished business leaders, philanthropists, and former policymakers to advise and support our center activities. 
Uh, and our increasing focus is on uh, the impact of disruptive technologies on risk and security. Um, and our semi-annual board meetings are actually underway right now. Uh, and we're covering topics from uh, the legal frameworks of geoengineering to, uh, to combat climate change, to risk of geopolitical destabilization in the Arctic region and so much in between. So I really encourage you to please keep in touch uh, and stay, um, stay focused on, uh, or, or not focused, excuse me, but, um, but stay tuned uh, to the work that's coming out of our center and, and please engage in a dialogue with us on that work. That's, uh, that I think is how we all join forces uh, and improve in this mission that we're all on. Uh, so as Dr. Gruber mentioned, I would venture to guess that Prior to 2020, this concept of global health security was perhaps not as front and center in your professional and personal lives as it is today. But of course, how could it not be front and center? Uh, certainly the reason why we are not able to meet in person today is the failure to uphold global health security. Um, you can imagine this was a, a less popular speech to give prior to 2020, but uh, has, uh, has increased in demand a bit since the start of the pandemic. But whether or not health security has been a common term to you or not, this practice of health security or the concept of halting the spread of infectious disease has long been a part of our history. Consider the image in the background. Here we see a lazaretto, a quarantine station for maritime travelers. Uh, this particular one that you see here is from uh, Voleta and was built in 1643. Even if we think about the term Lazaretto, we hear the biblical name Lazarus, the patron saint of lepers. So all of history can really be understood through this lens of infectious diseases and how they've come to shape uh, humanity. But now forces of globalization, for example, the sheer speed with which we traverse the planet are making it more difficult to maintain an equilibrium among microbes and human health. And if COVID-19 is any signal of this, our systems of governance and global health security are woefully inadequate. So this evening, I'd like uh, us to start by thinking about some of the existing shortcomings in global health security governance, followed by two new classifications of threats to health security that stem from emerging trends within globalization. But first, I'd like to briefly provide a background on the concept of health security and modern governance structures that are in place to enforce health security. So let's start by going right to the source. Uh, the, the World Health Organization currently defines, I'm sorry, um, the, World, the World Health Organization, uh, starting back in its, uh, its constitution from 1946, has long defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being. And it adds as well that this is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security. So now the WHO currently defines health security as quote, the activities required both proactive and reactive to minimize the danger and impacts of acute public health events that endanger people's health across geographical regions and in international boundaries. But in its operationalization, Health security has largely been synonymous with preventing pandemics, largely to keep military forces healthy as they engage in, in, in uh, uh, global um, uh, missions, um, as well as preventing bioterrorism attacks. So allow me to walk through the modern governance structures of health security and to help us take stock of where we are now. The international health regulations were ratified through the WHO in 1969. The international health regulations outlined the requirements that each member state report disease outbreaks to the WHO and adopt sanitary and hygiene measures and if applicable vaccinations at points of entry into certain countries. From the period of 1973 to 1981, the international health regulations were strengthened to account for outbreaks of cholera, plague and yellow fever. And in fact, if you have one of these yellow uh, international certificates, then you have been personally impacted by the international health regulations. So this is actually a WHO um, approved document uh, and it shows that I have a yellow fever vaccine and can enter into one of my uh, common field sites of Uganda. So that may or may not be familiar to you, but that is essentially the, the origin of it. Um, 
Then again, let's fast forward to 1995. We have the spread of HIV compounded by the rise of international trade and travel, once again, challenging the existing scope of the international health regulations. And it's interesting that it really took up until this point to integrate governance of global health that encompass norms and principles of trade, human rights, environmental protection, and security. And perhaps on a more cynical side, one could also argue that it was not until HIV AIDS impacted Western and Northern countries that we saw this shift in political will. Uh, but by 2005, the SARS epidemic, coupled with the recognition that natural disasters and conflict were also major causes of ill health and instability, all once again exposed shortcomings in the international health regulations. So one critical factor that happened in, in 2005 was the implementation of constant surveillance, which was ratified by all member states, and it was intended to be legally binding. The revised international health regulations furthermore required states to report any public health emergency of international concern or events such as emerging infectious diseases that could spread internationally and may require a coordinated international response to the WHO within 24 hours of discovery. In addition, the revisions enabled reporting by non-state actors. So these could be healthcare workers or scientists. So now you may be aware that there were medical professionals in Wuhan, China, who tried to speak out about COVID-19 early on, but were silenced, thus revealing a lack of enforcement of the international health regulations. But a bit more on that shortly. Then in quick succession, the world saw H1N1, H5N1, MERS, and Ebola all surface and become close calls or narrowly missed pandemics it was clear that more had to be done to strengthen the international health regulations. In 2014, the G7 endorsed the Global Health Security Agenda, which is a partnership among 50 different countries and several NGOs. The Global Health Security uh, Agenda set concrete action plans for countries to maintain their commitment to the uh, international health regulations. These plans of action range from building healthcare personnel capacity to funding the WHO's Joint External Evaluation Service. The Global Health Security Agenda, the real advantage of it, as it was uh, described to me by several uh, insider stakeholders, was that it provided metrics and benchmarks to track compliance with the international health regulations. Then most recently in 2019, uh, the Johns Hopkins University and the Nuclear Threat Initiative created the Global Health Security Index to serve as a comprehensive tool with which to identify systemic vulnerabilities with respect to global health security. The Global Health Security Index ranked 195 countries that are currently bound to the international health regulations with the purpose of stimulating reforms in lower ranked countries and to solidify support for global health security preparedness. So in other words, if you were ranked 195 out of 195 countries, you sort of realize that maybe you had some work to do uh, in, this, um, in this particular realm. So without looking up the answer, I'd like to ask you to guess which country ranked number one in global health security preparedness. And by the way, this has become one of my, my favorite ways to start a conversation. So just throw it in the chat if you'd like. And perhaps uh, uh, Miriam might be able to read off any of the answers if they come in. Yes, I will. So which country is, uh, was deemed in 2019 as the most prepared? There is one answer. It says it says Germany, one vote for Taiwan, one Japan, Jap Japan, another vote for Japan. Huh? South Korea. Excellent. Canada, Excellent. Uh -huh. Singapore.
Terrific. Well, like I said, if you are ever looking for a good conversation starter, I think that this, uh, this might be an interesting one. Let me show you the answer. The United States of America ranked number one. Um, so even pre-COVID-19, I couldn't believe this, right? How could it be that the US was ranked number one with respect to preparedness? For the record, I want to add that the United States, United States ranked 175th out of 195 countries with respect to access to healthcare. It also received a zero on measures of public confidence in government. So in other words, it's pretty clear that the Global Health Security Index missed a few critical factors, such as political leadership. We only need to think about uh, President Trump abruptly leaving the WHO towards the end of his term, uh, as well as a lack of trust in civic institutions and in science. But on another level, we can also interrogate the point of ranking sovereign states when no matter what, no one country can be spared from risk of public health threats like COVID-19. The world, after all, is only as secure and healthy as its least secure and healthy population on the planet. So the oversights on the part of the Global Health Security Index and the obvious fact that the world is still reeling from COVID-19 point to shortcomings in governance of health security. Critics of existing mechanisms of governance for health security have conceived of it as a cycle of crisis and complacency. And I find this to be a, a, really, um, a really good visual for, for where we find ourselves with respect to governance for global health security. So in other words, after the 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic, the world kept heralding that we would strengthen global health uh, surveillance to such a degree that we would never again be exposed to such a risk. In other words, we act, and then we get what I think of as historical amnesia, and then another threat arises, and then we act, and we get historical amnesia, et cetera, et cetera. One of the problems is that, as I mentioned, the international health regulations lack enforcement. As we say in English, they have no teeth. For example, during the 2007 H5N1 outbreak, Indonesia refused to share samples of the virus with the WHO. In addition, earlier reports found that only 15% of countries worldwide actually adhered to even basic uh, international health regulation standards. And China did suppress reports of COVID-19 in direct violation of the international health regulations. The field is also plagued by flimsy episodic commitment to funding. Part of this is a lack of vision on the part of governments to understand that health security is as pivotal to overarching security as, say, counterintelligence or the development of a space force. Health security, plain and simple, is routinely sidelined. Part of this is driven by rising nationalism and waning multilateralism, a theme which I'm sure comes as no surprise to this audience. Vaccine nationalism or a nation state's deliberate attempt to gain first access to vaccines and critical components for vaccine production has both obstructed equitable access to vaccines for low-income countries and exacerbated the economic impact of infectious diseases worldwide. In fact, recent estimates predict that the US, the UK, and the EU could collectively lose upwards of $119 billion a year if low-income countries are uh, continuously denied a proper sample of the COVID-19 vaccine. Furthermore, not providing access to the vaccine fuels the rise of novel strains, which could in turn render existing vaccines obsolete. And I'm sure uh, we are all um, familiar with the, the truly devastating situation that's happening right now in India, uh, one of the world's leading producers of vaccines. Um, but of course, uh, access to the vaccine uh, has been uh, truly inadequate, um, leading to, uh, to a, a major human rights um, uh, issue currently. And I'm sure we're all feeling that. It's also no secret that global superpowers are entrenched in information wars over social media. The rapid spread of misinformation and disinformation is chipping away at the integrity of trust in scientific facts, which of course is a necessary prerequisite for health security particularly in democrat, dem, democratic societies. A final issue is in this term global health itself. 
Global health was intended to convey the sense of shared risk for public health threats, but there's still a bias towards thinking that global health risks are out there, right? There's this false divide among the local and the global in our current practice of global health. And the picture is about to get a lot more complicated as we add the digital realm sort of orthogonally into this local and global continuum. So in this next section, I'd like to propose two currently overlooked classifications of challenges within the discourse of global health security, despite the fact that, of course, I want to recognize that global health security in general has already undergone a pretty massive transformation born out of necessity during COVID-19. So if you recall, health security to a large degree encompassed the prevention of pandemics and the prevention of bioterrorism. But if we are to truly take health security as this sort of fundamental element of the security of our economic, social, and political systems, then we must incorporate both the rise of digital technologies and a class of threats my colleague Elta Smith and I call slow burn threats. Slow burn threats encompass risks that are difficult to identify have long-term consequences, and require systems-level solutions. Climate change is a quintessential example of a slow burn threat, right? Uh, we've, we've heard the danger signs of, of climate change be heralded for, uh, for decades, uh, and, and it may now be reaching a point where, let's say we're at a critical juncture, um, where we don't have a moment to lose, right? But it can be difficult to garner and sustain support and funding for these threats until they reach a fever pitch, and it may in fact be too late to act. Here's an example of a slow burn threat that I suspect uh, most Europeans are not yet facing to the degree that Americans are. About a decade ago, U.S. military generals sounded the alarm that rising childhood obesity had left military recruits, quote, too fat to fight. Obesity, especially childhood obesity, has a complex suite of causes, including inequality, lack of access to healthy foods, and a lack of physical activity. Uh, downstream, it of course can have real impacts on security through redu reduced military force readiness. And in case you were wondering, these military generals issued yet another report um, after following their 2010 Too Fat to Fight report called uh, Still Too Fat to Fight. A second example is the rise of antimicrobial resistance, which is gaining prominence in global health security discourse, but is likely still wholly underestimated with respect to deaths and cost. Antimicrobial resistance is fueled by the prolonged misuse and overuse of antibiotics in both our healthcare settings and food supply chains. Estimates suggest that by 2050, deaths attributed to antimicrobial resistance could outstrip cancer deaths. But the problem is that it's really our business as usual, our everyday life that is fanning the flame of antimicrobial resistance, making it a prime slow burn threat. A third example is the rise of mental and behavioral health disorders, which at least pre-COVID was the leading public health disorder in the WHO European region. The rise in mental and behavioral health issues destabilizes social cohesion, it weakens workforces, and it creates costly social, demographic, and economic consequences. So why do we miss slow burn threats, aside from the fact that we have massive literal conflagrations happening all around? Well, for one, we have a political bias towards responding to crises, in other words, being tactical and operational versus privileging preparedness for pending but plausible crises. Secondly, these threats are perennial. That means they don't lend themselves to being fixed by policies that are bound to an election cycle. There's not one uh, president, there's not one prime minister, there's not one director of the WHO who's going to make lasting change, right? It will take uh, continued support. Plus, the only way that we know these policies are working is when the world is not on fire, right? Or not uh, finding itself in the midst of a global pandemic. Slow burn threats are hard to measure, but 
I often think that that's really more of a lack of imagination. Hindering that kind of creative systems level thinking is the fact that policymakers, multilateral organizations, and their budgets are siloed, right? We don't talk to each other. We don't connect the dots. And as an anthropologist, I also want to highlight that, at least in the United States, we have a cultural bias towards an individual locus of control. So something like obesity or drug use is seen as the responsibility of an individual. When we know that the reasons for these issues are multifaceted, layered, and complex. So we continually, and continually mistake structural problems for individual failures. And it simply will not work in today's world. We need to literally draw out lines and connections among public health phenomena and secondary and tertiary security threats. And then we need to map out responsible stakeholders and rally around missions and budgets to address slow burn threats. The second class of threats stem from the rise of the digital realm, which is converging on health security among virtually every other aspect of security faster than existing governance structures can adapt. We know this through examples like the trade of illicit goods on the dark web, the rise of cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and cyber attacks of power grids. As is the case with slow burn threats, I'll present just three of several examples that are creating opportunities to both strengthen and to threaten health security. The first issue is the rise of social media within the digital realm. Social media can provide immense amounts of data which can be helpful for understanding and tracking public health phenomena and just quickly sharing important information. But it can also fall prey to subversive misinformation and disinformation campaigns. The image you see here is from a recent RAND Corporation report on efforts on the part of Russia and China to attack the United States through misinformation of COVID-19 through social media. In the second, digital epidemiology or the use of big data that can come from outside of traditional public health surveillance systems can massively increase the speed and robustness of disease surveillance. But there's also reason to think that it could lead to a fair amount of false positives. And in any event, what is the guarantee that it would lead to global action to combat an emerging infectious disease threat? In other words, even if uh, 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 someone were to sound the alarm about uh, an emerging threat, would we actually see uh, concerted global efforts to, uh, to counteract that threat? In the past, uh, certainly that's been limited. Lastly, the rise of computational genetics can speed up the identification of new infectious diseases and more generally enhance our understanding of how genetic differences shape our ecology and even make us more susceptible to diseases. But these data could also be used to create an even more potent targeted biological weapon. Biological data is just as vulnerable to any cyber attack, but perhaps more consequential in the long run than we can even begin to imagine. This is a major concern among US FBI agents who warn of efforts by the Chinese to steal genetic data, but Americans continue to freely offer up their genetic data and other forms of data through commercial devices. So while COVID-19 dominates the present day, we are also still dealing with terrorism and extremism, human displacement, cyber warfare, loss of biodiversity, and of course, climate change. Managing traditional security threats has become challenging, while managing complex threats appears to be nearly impossible. But overlooking global health security and the ties it shares with social and economic vitality of the world population would not only set us up to repeat the failures observed throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, but certainly vulnerable to subsequent unprecedented health threats. So against that backdrop, how do we begin to look over the horizon? Well, to begin, irrespective of our disciplines, we must make the future a present day emergency. Health security must once and for all become a fundamental pillar of global security. And we need the political will to do what is right, which is not always terribly exciting and won't always bear flashy fruit. If the representatives of our community and those who rely on our work 
do not envision and essentially make the future a present day emergency. We may divert our attention far enough away from these threats only to eventually find irreversible complex crises. This will absolutely require the incorporation of threats and opportunities that are being ushered in through shifting trends in globalization. Lastly, the ways that multilateralism allows for sovereign states to hedge on their commitments to global treaties and regulations without facing consequences simply will not suffice, right? This whole sense of, of our multilateral uh, agreements not uh, having any teeth, as I mentioned, is, is simply going to lead us uh, potentially into disaster. So in that vein, plans of action will have to include uh, the rise of non-state actors as well in this increasingly globalized, fast-paced world. There are, of course, many more steps to be drawn out, and I gladly welcome and appreciate your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for those really, really interesting insights in public health and global health security issues. Um, now we have time for some questions. I received one from uh, Linda Giraldello. She writes, Thank you, Professor Baskill, for this interesting speech. My question to you as an anthropologist concerns, concerns the intersection between individual and collective factors of health and well-being. Concretely, how are health individual well-beings connected to issues such as social cohesion, social trust and culture? Can resilience to COVID-19 be analyzed in relation to social and collective aspects that are not traditionally brought in relation to health? That's a terrific question, and I and I, I thank the attendee uh, kindly for it. Um, it's a, it, it's one that I really grapple with often, uh, and most of the time when I think about it, I think about how. Uh, faster technologies um, that come to bear on how we communicate, uh, how we shop, how we uh, connect with one another, um, and, and, and more fundamentally, how we understand ourselves um, are fundamentally shaping and reshaping our identities. I think that we have found ourselves in a time where uh, it's becoming really difficult to stay anchored to our communities. Um, to phenomena that are happening uh, quite locally, right? Um, and uh, to scientific fact. Uh, and I think that this has shown, um, shown itself, uh, reared its ugly head, if you will, um, in, in quite a negative way throughout COVID-19 um, and really broken down or chipped away at, um, at systems of resilience. So I think what COVID-19 has exposed, uh, to your very astute point, is that uh, resilience to health security crises is so much more than um, creating something like having medical countermeasures or having good supply chains for uh, distributing vaccines, right? It really is about um, feeling as though there is, there is a collective sense that is bigger than you, um, that you, for instance, wear a mask uh, to protect your neighbors or get a vaccine to protect your neighbors. Um, uh, that you see the world, uh, you know, not only as, you know, your own community and your own country, but that all of us are, are wrapped up. Um, you know, I, I truly meant that and, and, and believe that, that we are only as safe and secure as our least safe and secure population on the planet. Um, and so I think that it, that it actually creates a really exciting time um, for all of us. And, and this is why I, I, I really only prefer to give this talk to an, uh, an interdisciplinary audience, because People thinking in, in public health in that sort of echo chamber are not going to come up with these answers of how we create more resilient societies and cultures. Um, and and I, I really think that it's going to take that more robust understanding of um, not only uh, how, we, how we think about um, public health, but how we really draw public health into um, into a, a, bring it into a, a, a fundamental pillar of our societies, of our governance, um, and how we think about um, the health and well-being of uh, our individual and our collective lives. 
I would love to write a book on that. I think I think that's great. If anybody here wants to <laughs> wants to contribute to a volume, I would I'd be very excited to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have another question from Roland Benedicta. Uh, where does the national field of bio cybersecurity stand? It seems to be crucial the more data are needed to feed AI driven, driven precise medicine around the world. Biodata spying is in the process of becoming a primary business. I know from my work with the Pentagon that there is a great concern since the attacks to collect mass individual biodata increased dramatically and preparedness is poor. What do you make of this extremely complex issue of bio cyber security which touches upon all realm of society uh herr dr benedicta um thank you very much uh that's that that is exactly um uh, one of the uh the the main topics at hand and issues at hand and and certainly why i wanted to bring it up um today uh, I, I appreciate the fact that you um, added a sense of urgency to it. I think that that is absolutely uh, spot on. Um, what we have here is, uh, you know, I think again, a really quintessential example of, of, of one of the main shifts in, in globalization, which is not only to faster technologies that are occurring within this sort of third realm uh, of a digital space outside of the local and, and the global, um, but we're also seeing the rise of, of non-state actors um, uh, and sort of traditional uh, or, or lack of traditional um, uh, uh, non-state actors who are able to wield incredible amounts of power through these technologies. Um, so this is kind of, you know, when people ask me what, what's the main difference in, in risk and security now versus even 30, 40 years ago, and that is the fact that, the, that people have incredible power uh, and uh, through the access to uh, uh, incredibly disruptive technologies, um, even a cell phone, um, uh, and and that these technologies can can drastically change the landscape of of risk and security. Now, with respect to bio cybersecurity, I would say that the globe as a whole is um, is woefully underprepared. Um, I think that our our systems of governance are weak. Um, and they're weak not only with respect to bio cybersecurity, but to cybersecurity in general. Um, for one, there's talk of establishing norms um, with respect to cyber warfare, uh, but whether or not these norms um, will actually take hold or be obeyed uh, is, um, is, is potentially quite worrisome. Um, uh, and and I'm, not, I'm not terribly hopeful uh, about it. Um, certainly, Whoever owns the data, uh, and particularly our, our biological and our genetic data going forward, will control the world. Um, the more that we know about uh, the genetic underpinnings of a particular society, or you know, think think about not just an individual, but on the grand scale of of um, AI and and machine learning, uh, whoever is able to um, have that power uh, of accessing those data is going to control the world, um, and. And we are not prepared for it. Uh, when I say we, um, I am, I'm sort of speaking from a U.S. perspective, but uh, you know, I'd like to include um, uh, you know, every country on, on the planet uh, in this regard. Um, you know, we can also think about how uh, emerging technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, gene editing technology could again really come to uh, to, to drastically reform um, our, our ecology. Um, and, and humanity writ large. And what we're seeing so far is that traditional um, uh, traditional protocols with respect to the scientific process uh, are, are really being obliterated when it comes to, um, to using these emerging technologies. So that's the more negative side of things um, because I'm, you know, we're thinking exclusively about bio cybersecurity. Now, the cat's out of the bag. So what do we do from here on out? How do we sort of leverage uh, the advantages of it, which could come in terms of um, uh, biosurveillance? Um, obviously, there's a, a really uh, rich opportunity um, for the commercialization uh, of these biotechnologies. Um, the, the bioeconomy is uh, certainly one of the fastest growing um, aspects of, of our global economy. Um, 
while simply while while still sort of safeguarding uh, uh, these um, these data. Um, I, I, my my sense is that this is absolutely one of the biggest challenges and one that is uh, going drastically uh, un under recognized and underappreciated. Uh, but I, I don't know if you're able to come off of me, but I would love to hear your your thoughts and perspectives on this too, or would be very happy to get in touch anytime, learn more from you. Thank you. Roland, you heard her, she, you can get in touch. Um, so the next question is from Lorena Marchetti. She writes, you talked about disinformation on social media. Disinformation campaigns in Japan have led to a drop in the vaccination rate of girls against cervical cancer from almost 80% to less than 1%. That is an insane decline and it lasted for years. Is there any way to counteract something like this? How? Lorena asks. Terrific question. And I was, uh, I was not aware of, uh, of the drop in, in the HPV vaccine uh, among girls. Um, I, I will, I'll, just a, a shameless public health plug that um, young boys should also be getting the HPV uh, vaccine. That's the human papillomavirus uh, vaccine. I recall when I lived in Austria, this was also a, a matter of debate um, and, and I always find it really interesting, but yes, please vaccinate your, your boys and your girls. Um, cervical cancer is one of those cancers that um, certainly does not have to be a, a, a public health threat to the world anymore, and yet it, uh, it, it certainly remains such. Okay, so let's step outside of, of uh, the HPV vaccine. And even if we think about the COVID-19 vaccine, um, uh, vaccine skepticism in the United States, I am no expert. There are uh, incredible global experts on, on this fascinating phenomenon of vaccine skepticism, uh, but it has been a major hindrance to, uh, to getting people vaccinated, uh, even within my home state of California. Uh, and it's really troublesome. Um, so what do we do on, a, uh, on an individual level, right, in the immediate here and now? I think in part, we have to leverage uh, social and cultural capital and, uh, and get people who are public figures to be speaking out against sort of the, the bots that are driving misinformation and disinformation on social media. Um, and then on another level, and this is a, a big part of uh, Rand's research, is on a phenomenon that we call truth decay. Really to think about um, uh, sort of the waning trust in civic institutions and in scientific fact uh, that we've been observing for, for decades, but has really sort of um, reached this fever pitch in the current moment. And I think that we have to teach people how to be more skeptical of information that they read on social media. I, I, I would make a petition to have this be um, a, a core aspect of children's curriculum um, uh, to understand and how to pick apart and do sort of fact checking um, uh, within social media. I think that that actually should be um, a, a critical part of, uh, of all that we do. Uh, and, and I think that it's on us as well as scholars to be, um, to be promoting that sort of sense of skepticism of, of things that we read uh, online. Um, and, and it's also on the part, so that's kind of the bottom up approach. And then there's also this, this, um, this top down approach where, um, Civic institutions, and I, I, again, I'm going to speak from the U.S. perspective because that's where I've been living for the last five years. Uh, and you know, you could probably tell I'm a Native American, um, or I, I am a, a Native U.S. citizen. Um, that there was so much confusion and chaos that was occurring um, uh, within the last administration that I think it, it, it quite honestly made people um, quite. Uh, skeptical and scared and nervous to place their trust uh, and, and particularly the health of their bodies and their families um, in messages that were coming out, uh, particularly from the government. So from an anthropologist side, I think meeting people with some empathy um, for the incredible chaos and confusion that surrounds all of us um, is a good place to start. And I always believe in having kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations um, uh, and, and, and starting with sort of changing hearts and minds. Um, 
but again, you know, that that's easier said than done. I recognize that, but I know, you know, at least in my own life, I've had several conversations with people to say, I understand why you would be scared and confused if you had read that kind of information. Let me offer a counterpoint. Um, and, uh, and I'm hopeful that um, that's one way that we can sort of start, start that conversation. Uh, but it's um, it's it's a pretty uh, troublesome scenario, um, especially when it comes to to public health. I had always thought, um, as I mentioned, I, I published a, a piece on global health uh, security um, and and threats and opportunities back in in December of 2019, and I so um, uh, naively thought that. If there was one thing that could bring my country back together, it would be something like a pandemic where we would all rally around um, sort of this common mission of defeating it. And, and quite frankly, I think it, it really it broke us apart even worse than, um, than I, I had ever imagined. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in this space, uh, but I, I think that it's on all of us um, to, uh, to, to, to play our own, our own individual parts, uh, both as global citizens as neighbors, as friends, uh, and as research scholars. Thank you. The next question comes from Claudia Gagliardini. Thank you, Professor. This one is the most interesting presentation I have ever seen on this topic. <laughs> so while people are, are learning that our safety is related to the safety of all population, I can also see vaccine, vaccine development and production managed as a race between countries. I'm working in this field. Should governments start to be more altruistic and how make this happen? That's a great question. And my colleagues actually, and, and thank you for the, the, the kind compliment. I, I really appreciate it um, and, and greatly appreciate the opportunity to be speaking with you all today. Um, so uh, my colleagues in RAND Europe, and I'm so happy to send you the report if you're interested. They did uh, an economic um, modeling exercise on the impacts of, uh, of what I called in, in the presentation vaccine nationalism. Um, so this sort of deliberate attempt to, uh, to, to um, stockpile or get, get first access to, to vaccines. Um, and and you, you raise this question of being altruistic. So I would not apply the label of altruism to it simply because like if we think about altruism in its purest form it is literally giving without any sort of benefit to come back to you but because of the fact that we're only as safe and healthy as our least safe and healthy uh, country on the planet whatever we do to bolster the health security of another population will inevitably come back and bolster our own uh, health security so it's not it, it, to me it's a smart tactic as opposed to a smart pragmatic tactic um, as opposed to one of, of altruism. Um, and I think that we have to start thinking about international uh, aid um, in that sort of uh, same lens as well. Um, I talked to colleagues at the United States uh, State Department a couple of years ago, and they said that the state of international aid, something like say um, donating supplies to, uh, to bolster um, health security capacity through personnel uh, or supplies um, had become as uh, unpopular as like wearing polyester bell-bottom uh, pants and platform shoes and saying the word groovy and you know basically they were they were saying it was as if someone was living in another time and era that no one was doing this anymore and I really thought that that was a major major miss uh, on the part of our wealthier nations, um, because the the more that we sort of let other countries lapse, um, the more that that you know we 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 place ourselves at a threat, and that's all separate and distinct from you know the other main issue at hand, which of course should be within all of our hearts, which is the human rights aspect of uh, of ensuring um, the health and vitality uh, of of all of our countries. Um, so how do we get there? Uh, you know, I I think. I close the, the talk by um, asking us all to draw out lines between public health phenomena and secondary and tertiary effects. So um, if we're trying to make an economic case for why health security would be so critical or why these investments would be so critical, um, then 
maybe we can influence policymakers by actually showing them the economic impacts, right? So something like uh, the EU, the UK, and the US losing $119 billion a year uh, if we are to, um, to leave uh, 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 lower income countries out to dry with respect to a vaccine. Well, you know, there's a, there's a big case for that. You know, we don't want to lose $119 billion a year and we can all contribute to it. Um, so that's just one example. I mean, another, of course, is, is the rise of, of uh, uh, chronic uh, and non-communicable diseases and mental and behavioral health disorders, uh, particularly within low and middle income countries. It's going completely overlooked. Um, but the more that we, again, sort of uh, leave an us versus them um, situation in the world, the more that we set us all up for failure. Um, and, and that's something that's, that's nothing new per se, but particularly when it comes to these, uh, what I deemed slow burn threats, um, the more that we can actually draw it out, um, I, I think the more we can make a case for action and, and hopefully uh, uh, put that action um, uh, into true motion. Thank you. Um, we should have time for one more question, if it's okay. Absolutely. Um, another one from Roland Benedikta concerning bioterrorism. We rarely hear about this issue, perhaps because it is too scaring and complex. Why is it not publicly present? Huh. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I would say that it actually has been, uh, it's taken, uh, it's been gaining in some prominence, I would say, um, just from the, uh, the prospect um, that COVID-19 or, or the, the, the presupposition that COVID-19 could have been um, something that was uh, deliberately released uh, by the Chinese. Of course, I'd like to underscore that, um, that uh, that is a myth. Um, it's been unfounded time and time again. So I, I don't want to sort of propagate any any kind of misinformation there. Um, but certainly it is possible, and even the United States does a lot of what we call dual use uh, research um, on uh, on uh, quite potent um, infectious agents. Uh, whether or not that could be um, uh, deliberately released is, uh, you know, has never happened, um, but it's certainly something that um, is, is on, the, on the minds of those who are working closely within security um, circles. I'd also like to add that 20 years ago, um, uh, the United States had uh, um, quite a scare of, of anthrax attacks. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this was as present um, uh, to a global audience, but um, but a terrorist was ma mailing anthrax uh, to um, to uh, United States officials. Um, it was a, a, a very scary time. The what I again want to underscore here is um, used to be pretty hard to pull off that kind of attack. It's not anymore. Um, it's not that hard to be a terrorist, um, and that to me is the scariest thing possible. Now. Again, one thing that I'd like to add here with respect to bioterrorism and say, you know, um, leveraging what we know from uh, 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 AI applications of, of biological and genetic data. So let's say somebody were to create that really potent infectious disease uh, and, and deliberately release it. If we think about this from a tactical standpoint, and again, I'm an anthropologist, so what do I know about you know, the, the minds of, of people who do this kind of security work? Not much, except let's think about this. If, if a, a nation state, let's say, were to release um, an infectious disease akin to COVID-19, or let's say you know, more virulent than, than, uh, than COVID-19, they would be putting their own people at risk, right? They'd be putting their own, um, their own forces at risk, unless, of course, they had already done a vaccine in X, Y, and Z. But when we think about global linkages in our, in our economic system, it would be absolutely ridiculous to, to, um, to take on that sort of attack. There's plenty of other areas for non-kinetic types of, of warfare, and space being this uh, emerging um, frontier for, uh, for warfare. Side issue, but fascinating. But what worries me more about that is the potential for um, 
sort of anarchy groups uh, to have access to that kind of um, biotechnology and 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 um, and to engage in in, a, in an attack of bioterrorism, um, where sort of they they wouldn't necessarily be concerned about the vitality of uh, of the health um, and, and economic and social well being of our global population. That that worries me um, a bit more. Um, but again, you know, I, I think uh, I think this is a really a rich and important space for for us to be interrogating, um, and uh, and something that uh, I, I I suspect. Um, well, let me put it this way: if if this is not a part and parcel of uh, of every security conference going forward, um, we are uh, we are potentially in trouble. I hate to end on that note, but <laughs> but. Um, but uh, again, you know that that's just to say that I, I really do appreciate um, uh, having the opportunity to discuss these topics today, and and hopefully I've I've given us some food for thought of how we can sort of rethink um, these upcoming challenges, these emerging threats, as well as opportunities within the space of global health security. And I hope that I've convinced you to see global health security as a fundamental pillar of of all that we do.